Thank you. Thanks so much, and we're really grateful to the uh, offices of um, Representatives Cole and Crowley for sponsoring this and for uh, um, taking leadership on the Rare Disease Caucus. Uh, that's a uh, okay, uh, that's a. Uh, those are friends that we could not do without. Well, today is about um, rare diseases and orphan drugs. The intent is to give you a little bit of an orphan 101 um, to take uh, uh, and explain the fundamentals of what every Hill staffer needs to know is what I titled this uh, talk. It may be a little uh, broad that regards, but orphans are special. And can I have the next slide, please? Uh, oh, I do want to mention that NORD, the National Organization for Rare Disorders, uh, is your uh, one-stop shopping for rare disease needs and for, um, for support and issues on, uh, on rare diseases in America. You'll hear shortly that there's a rich history that NORD has, and, and you'll hear a little bit about that. Um, whenever uh, policy issues come up, um, this is the name that people look to on, uh, on the Hill to give some answers, and that's one of the reasons why I just le I retired from the federal government myself. I was uh, the director of the Office of Orphan Products Development for the last four, f four years or so at uh, FDA, and uh, came over to um, uh, the other side, the bright side in this case, uh, of NORD uh, representing patients. So next slide. So what are we going to do here today in the next few minutes? I just want to go through and say, uh, explain why rare diseases are special, uh, why they're different. We know they're rare, right, by definition. But um, what else is different about them? And the orphan drug experience, uh, the, the process and the activity, the endeavor of making drugs to treat these diseases is a uniquely American expression. It's an expression of our democracy. And you're going to hear a little bit about how uh, it's an expression of our economy. It's an expression of of our way, essentially American way of doing things. And, and I, I'd like to make a case for that. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about who is making these orphan drugs now. Um, what is that sector of the pharmaceutical, um, the pharmaceutical industry and what the challenge is before us? Next slide. Next slide. That's okay. Okay, so I will transport you to begin with back to the uh, year uh, 1982, prior to the Orphan Drug Act, which came in in, in uh, 1983. Some of you were not yet born. Uh, I was. And um, the, 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 the fundamental process of the industry of drug creation is a company puts in a lot of money, develops a drug, that's the real expensive part, is getting it proven to be scientifically useful for the treatment of a disease, not actually making the drug. That tends to be a very trivial part of the whole thing, um, but, but developing the drug, and then sells it to patients who pay them, and they recoup their costs. Well, this doesn't work for rare diseases because, by definition, there are very few people to buy those pills. Um, and so the numbers show, show that out. In 1973 until 1982, there were only about 10 new drugs over those 10 years for um, rare diseases that were even licensed by the FDA. So very little activity was going on in this. Um, but as has already been mentioned, there are about 7,000 rare diseases. It is really amazing. It makes the head spin all the many ways that the, the human body can break down. Um, and these rare diseases affect about 25, 30 million people in, in the United States. Most important for you all, um, congressmen and senators are regularly besieged by the concerns of parents who often come with their children saying, my God, this is a tragedy. We've got to be doing some more research. And this is a common part of the weekly work life here in this building and in the buildings around it. So um, hopefully this talk today will give you a little richer understanding of how to respond to that need of the American people. Next slide. Okay, well, move into 1982, uh, a housewife from Danbury, Connecticut, uh, a lady by the name of uh, Abby Meyer, not a scientist, an art major actually, uh, who had a couple of kids that were on a clinical trial and the large pharmaceutical company pulled their clinical trial because uh, they didn't think they could make any money at it, naturally. Um, well, hell hath no fury like a mother um, in the defense of her children. And um, she recognized that it, rare diseases are individually infrequent by definition, right? But they're collectively common. And if she could go and get this rare disease, that rare disease, the other rare disease, she could found this organization called NORD, which she headed up for about 25 years. This is a picture from her retirement ceremony. And, um, and there was an obscure congressman, by the, uh, a senator, excuse me, by the name of Henry Waxman. You may have heard of him. And he said that orphans 
uh, these drugs are like orphans in that they require special care, the founder of the Orphan Drug Act. Next slide. So what is this Orphan Drug Act thing? Um, basically, the New Deal was if you get a drug designated on the basis of two things. Number one, that it's promising. Now, promising is a very low evidentiary bar. Uh, there's reason to believe that there's hope. The thing works in animals, say. Uh, or there's a couple of people who were treated with it and they seem to have gotten better. Promising. That's not effective. That's promising. And you show that it's for treating fewer than 200,000 people. That's the bar. That's the limit for what is rare and what is not. You still have to do clinical trials. And this is one of the major issues facing our community today is that as Abby saw it, we didn't want drugs for people with rare diseases that didn't work. We didn't want them to be held to a different evidentiary bar. We wanted them to work. And so they still have to go through and be proven by FDA to work um, and be safe in that context. The two go together. If you do that, what do you get? You get the biggest thing was market exclusivity, seven years of market exclusivity, during which nobody else can come forward with that same drug for that same disease, uh, like a generic, and, and cut into your market. Um, and there were tax credits and fee exemptions. Next slide, please. OK. The Orphan Drug Act is, bar none, the single piece of legislation that is the most successful in the history of the United States of America. Uh, 391 approved products have come forward. Um, they have been drawn out of this designation of uh, 2,517. These were accurate as of a couple of weeks ago anyways. And orphan drugs have become the biggest, growingest part of the pharmaceutical sector. Uh, between a third and a half of all FDA approvals now are uh, new molecular entities, that's what NMEs, new molecular entities are for orphan products, for rare diseases. However, we still got 7,000 rare diseases. You know, that's 400 and they actually, uh, almost 400, and they actually only treat about 200 diseases because some of them treat more than, you know, there's sometimes, some diseases have more than one drug for them. So 7,000 rare diseases. Next slide. This is a picture just to show you how this has progressed. The uh, blue bars are the designations. The red bars are the actual approvals. You can see that the designation pool has started on an exponential track upward. There is a long delay between a designation and an approval. And you can see that the approvals themselves have sort of meandered along at the same rate. Next slide. So what's your typical orphan drug? Uh, next slide. Uh, this pie shows you that the biggest sector are oncology products, so rare cancers. But virtually every kind of way that the body can break down um, has been addressed by uh, orphan drugs. Next slide. Um, here's an example of one of the first ones, the bubble boy. Some of you may have seen this. This is uh, because children with a certain um, enzyme uh, genetic defect are very susceptible to infections and they have to be secluded. Next slide. This talks a little bit about ADA, Adagen. Uh, it's one of the first orphan drugs that was approved. It was approved based on a trial of 12 people. It's an enzyme replacement. It was designated in 1984, and it's one of the causes of severe combined immunodeficiency. It affects between like one in 100,000, one, uh, one in a million uh, children who are born. Next slide. Um, there are new gene therapies, and uh, this is an article from uh, 2009. It now has orphan status designation. It's in active development. We may see our very first gene therapy, uh, um, which is an orphan for the treatment of this disease. Next slide. Um, naglazyme uh, is uh, mucopolysaccharidosis type 6. It's estimated that there's only like 1,100 cases worldwide, but the enzyme replacements can prevent these really dramatic changes. So you can have normal kids where before you couldn't. These drugs are transformative. They make the dead get up. They make the blind see. Next slide. Um, so enzyme replacement therapies are not without some controversy, though. Uh, they are really the most extraordinarily expensive treatments in the history of humankind. $400,000, $700,000 per patient per year for some of these. And as you know, FDA doesn't regulate the price. Um, yet they are radically transformative in, the patients, in their benefits to patients' lives. The exclusivity lasts seven years. After that, competitors can come in and the price can be driven down. But the knowledge is eternal and it wouldn't be reached without the incentive of the Orphan Drug Act. Next slide. Um, just to give you a little bit of the breath, uh, orphan drugs are also used for bioterrorism because fortunately there isn't a lot of plutonium poisoning going on around here. So the population is very, very low. Uh, and um, we have at least a couple of those. Next slide. Uh, 
Orphan drugs are also useful for drugs which are common elsewhere but rare here because the statute says it's only for 200,000 people in the United States. So treatments for malaria, which has hundreds of millions of cases worldwide, still qualify for the benefits of the Orphan Drug Act. And this is uh, of African sleeping sickness, African trypanosomiasis. It's just an another slide to, oh, whoop. Okay, just another slide to show you that um, gene therapies are starting to take off in orphan drug development. Next slide. And to mention again that orphans are special, that they're transformative. They fit like a key in a molecular lock. That's the reason why the trials can be so small is because the effects are so big. Um, and uh, the effect size and public health imperative speeds approval through the process. Next slide. Uh, they're special from the agency's perspective, too. I can report that since I was there. Uh, a treatment for a common disease frequently represents a public health threat. Oh my God, if we give this to 20, 30 million Americans, what happens if there's an adverse event that occurs in one out of 30,000 people that, that are going to die? Um, yet treatments for a rare disease represent an incredible public health opportunity, because usually there's nothing else that's out there. And, um, and, and often the benefits will far outweigh the risk. Historically, there's been great flexibility demonstrated by the agency with regards to the review of orphan products. Um, the, the numbers of clinical trials required, um, if we look at the data, appear to be less. The size of the clinical trials appears to be smaller. The design of the clinical trials appears to be more flexible. So there's incredible flexibility that has been demonstrated historically. What we don't have right now is we don't have FDA policy that says orphan drugs are treated in any way different. Part of that is, as I mentioned, Abby wanted to make certain that the efficacy standards were held high. And we, as high as every, as anywhere else for any common diseases, because people with rare diseases are entitled to drugs that actually work. But the policy is no policy, and we have asked at Nord for consideration of a formal policy that there shall be flexibility in the consideration of these, of these drugs. Next slide. Um, so who's been doing this? Who has actually been creating these drugs? Um, we are at a stage right now where you can make orphan drugs in, with garage science. We're sort of now in orphan drug uh, development where Steve Jobs was uh, 30, 40 years ago uh, in terms of innovation. This is done by people with fire in their belly. And if any of you saw the movie uh, Extraordinary Measures that starred um, um, Harrison Ford. Thank you so much, Harrison Ford. Um, it's the story of John Crowley, the other Crowley in this uh, community, who uh, really, as a parent, and their, his story is un not unique, I have to say, went forward and uh, moved a new drug forward. Uh, large pharmaceutical companies have been um, tardy to the party, I guess you might say. They're interested in orphan drug development now that a lot of their other stuff is going off, but um, uh, they mostly have worked in oncology and acquisitions. Next slide. I better move right along because I see Jason looking at his watch and I have a three o'clock. So uh, this is an, again to say that large pharmaceutical companies have some cultural impediments. Hopefully they can be overcome. Next slide. Uh, and so the take home messages are these. Uh, orphan drugs are special. They are different from all the other kinds of drug development. Um, the business is vibrant. It's one of the bright, um, the bright lights in an otherwise rather dismal economy. And the beneficence is awesome. Uh, there are about 400 drugs, but they're only for about 200 diseases, and there are 7,000 diseases that are waiting. So that's a huge challenge. The policies of our day is how to stimulate innovation, to build upon these successes while retaining efficacy standards that have served us so very well to date, uh, and deliver science from the laboratory to the bedside without delay. And with that, your basic orientation to orphan drugs and uh, rare diseases is completed. And now we'll hear.